climate change, but hopefully the ideas we talk about will be relevant to the respective fields in which you will work or are um, concerned with. And we're going to give you some, some different contrasting perspectives to try and sort of stir up um, a bit of debate. And what I want to start by arguing is that the vast proportion of environmental impacts that we as people have on the planet can be attributed to individuals. So one study, for example, in the US, colleagues in the US found that 80% of the energy we use and the greenhouse gases that result from that can be attributed to our demand as consumers for goods and services. And then the activities in the economy that are required to provide us with those goods and services. 80%, so that's four-fifths of the total greenhouse gas impact attributed to us as individuals. But the good news is a large proportion of those impacts can be reduced if we change our behaviour, again, as individuals. So uh, an eminent sociologist in the US, Tom Dietz, uh, wrote uh, an academic uh, uh, article a few years back arguing that 17 household actions, if you think about the household, 17 things we can do now with available resources and available technologies can reduce our emissions and our energy use in homes by 20%, one off. So these are things like the mundane things like insulating our walls and around our doors and windows, installing efficient appliances, uh, using eco settings on appliances like washing machines and so on. So 20% can be reduced almost immediately if we take these actions. So in order to try and achieve this behaviour change, we need to first understand how and why people behave the way they do. And we'll give you some different perspectives on that. So the first thing that I want to say is that money matters. We are strongly influenced by the economy. And you don't have to just take my word for it or the Treasury's word for it. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Roger Fouquet, down at the London School of Economics, has looked at the consumption in the UK of energy services, useful things that we get from energy. Mobility, getting us around. Heating, making our homes cosy. Lighting, and so on and so on. And he's looked at this for 300 years, and he's looked at what happens when prices go down. There is not a single example of prices going down and our demand doing anything other than going up. If things get cheaper, we consume more of them. Very, very uh, strong evidence for this. So money matters, but it's clearly not the only story. Uh, if an economist, or a very narrow-minded economist, was to come round any of your homes they would observe £20 notes lying all over the floor. Not literally, but each uh, conventional light bulb, each single-paned window, each uninsulated door frame and window frame, each inefficient appliance represents a waste of your money. Yet you have them in all of your homes. I would put money on that, even the most energy efficient of you. So clearly, there's lots of other stuff going on. And uh, Paul Stern, who is an American psychologist, works for the National Academy of Sciences, he says, we are, as individuals, we are rational. We do things for a reason. Uh, but we are not just cost-benefit analysts seeking profit or seeking to save money. We are also consumers with desires for all sorts of non-financial uh, attributes. We're people who express our values. We're social animals who are influenced by our peers. Uh, we're easygoers who want to minimise hassle and minimise effort, and so on and so on. Many ways in which we act as individuals that isn't just about money. In other words, our psychology, our cognition, how and why we think what we do is crucially important. And there's been a wealth of popular writing about this uh, recently. So some of you may have seen Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Nobel Laureate Economist, writing about how what psychology tells us about all the weird and wonderful ways we act as individuals. Uh, Dan Arley, uh, predictably irrational, and then possibly the most well-known one, Nudge, which I'll come back to uh, a little bit later on. But all of this work is work communicating all of the ways in which we act strangely as individuals. Um, now, from an environmental perspective, we're most interested in how all of these ways we behave as individuals create barriers to pro-environmental behaviour. So Bob Gifford, who's the 
uh, editor of a journal called the Journal of Environmental Psychology, he calls these the dragons of inactions, a rather kind of overall term, but he describes these barriers to pro-environmental behaviour as dragons because for Westerners, no matter what form or shape dragons take, they always tend to act in stories as being barriers preventing us from achieving goals. And the goal in this case is environmental behaviour. So, examples of these dragons. We might have a limited awareness or understanding of a given issue. We tend to be congenitally optimistic. We tend to have strong ideologies and worldviews that, for example, may make us have faith in technology and its ability to save us. We may be concerned with comparing ourselves with others, and therefore it's unfair if we take action and others don't, and so on, and so on, and so on. Many of these uh, barriers to pro-environmental behaviour. And so changing behaviour, what both Tom and I will talk about in the second ten minutes of our, of our little introduction, uh, is crucially important uh, by acting on both the context in which we make decisions and particularly on individual psychology and cognition. And just as a final comment, a crucial part of that context is other people. So we, are, we imitate others, we observe others, we role model to others. What others do is crucially uh, important. And so social context, as well as our individual psychology, are both the keys to addressing pro-environmental behaviour. With that, I will pass over to the <coughs> top. Thank you very much, Charlie. Okay, so I'm going to give then a very different perspective, I think, on what's involved in thinking about changing behaviour. Where I'd start is I agree entirely with Charlie that it's absolutely critical that we significantly change our conventional ways of life. If we're to address modern um, environmental problems, whether it's climate change, biodiversity loss or whatever, we need to radically change what we do. But where I depart from Charlie, where I disagree, is in taking the individual in his or her decision-making, his or her choices, as the starting point. Simply trying to change how individuals behave is not enough. Now, why do I say this? I say this basically because nobody, no one in this room, or nobody anywhere, I think, actively wants or chooses to use environmental resources, energy, water, to generate waste, to cause carbon dioxide emissions, and so on. Nobody wants to do this. Instead, we almost have to do this in order simply to be normal, socially accepted people. Normal ways of life demand ever more uh, resource consumption. And the way that they've evolved and changed over time means that increasingly just to be a normal person means being unsustainable. So what we need to focus on, I would say, is not so much individuals and their choices, because remember, no one's choosing to do this deliberately, but those normal activities or, or so, conventional social practices, things like cooking or travelling to work or heating our homes or doing the laundry, things like that, that have changed over time in ever more resource-intensive directions. So the challenge then is focusing not on individuals and behaviours, but on these activities and thinking about how it is they came to be so resource intensive and what, if anything, we might be able to do to change that. So I'll just finish this first kind of introduction with two kind of quick examples of that, quite mon deliberately mundane, everyday examples. So the first one, I want to focus on laundry, washing clothes. Now, once upon a time, this was something that we perhaps took the relatively few clothes we had down to the river or collected some water from the well in order to wash our clothes. We did this once a week. It was actually a social event, the wash day. It was quite a big sort of thing. Society was ordered and structured around people doing the wash in this sort of way. And think then how that system of laundry from a long time ago is different today. Today we have electricity and hot water piped into our homes. Laundry is something that's done in and around other activities on an almost daily basis. The amount of clothes that we wash is far larger now than it ever has been before. We have sophisticated detergents and machinery in our homes that allows us to do these things, to, to, to wash our clothes arguably with less effort. Essentially what I'm saying is that a whole social and technical system has grown up around something as boring as doing the laundry and that has entailed huge resourcing cons consumption simply because of the way that system has evolved over time. So the point I'm trying to make here is that this system, this 
historical trend is not the result of individual behaviours, individuals making decisions. It's about a whole range of actors coming together to direct life in ever more resource-intensive directions. So in other words, if you want to change this, if you want to reduce the resource intensity of doing the laundry, we need to think not about changing individual behaviours, but changing the system. A similar but then slightly different example can be told for something like heating the home, so home heating. Now, I'm sure many of you know that the emissions and energy use involved in heating homes is a major source of carbon dioxide emissions. It makes up roughly two-thirds of UK um, domestic emissions from heating alone. And in the last 50 or so years, we've seen indoor climate change of around a 7 degree rise. In the 1950s, 60s, average indoor temperature in the UK was about 13 or 14 degrees. Today, it's more like 20, 21. The days of waking up with frost on the inside of the window or being able to see your breath are no longer. The punishment of sending your children to their bedroom doesn't quite have the same bite when their bedroom has got a computer and a TV in it and it's just as warm as everywhere else in the house. But so what, what's happened? I mean, the reason for this is kind of obvious, right? It's the rise of central heating systems, which suddenly, though, have changed the way we think about and organise our domestic lives. Once upon a time, you'd have one room heated, you'd huddle together, you'd behave as a family and so on and so forth. Whereas now you spend more time in your separate rooms watching the TV, playing computer games, doing different kinds of things. And you start to become uncomfortable in any temperature other than 18 to 21 degrees, where once upon a time you'd have been able to adapt to different kinds of temperatures. So again, though, what we see here is a whole system has grown up around how we heat our homes that's led to hugely um, more resource-intensive you know, use of environmental resources. Indeed, now the ability to produce 18 to 21 degrees all year round is written into building codes. Builders, constructive industry, cannot build houses that aren't able to achieve this. So we actually have laws that enshrine unsustainable levels of resource use. So again, I hope what it's clear I'm trying to say is this is not about individuals and the decisions. This is about larger scale social and technological systems and how it is they're evolving in more resource intensive ways. And so I will sum up there by saying if we want to make a meaningful dent into our resource, resource consumption of normal everyday life, it's these systems we need to change, not merely individual decisions and choices. Charlie. Okay, so they were our different diagnoses of the problem. So the question is, well, what then follows in terms of solutions? How do we try and reduce our environmental Im uh, impact? So what follows from my arguments were essentially a focus on two elements, context and decision making or cognition. In other words, we make decisions in a context, we can, affect, we can address the context or we can address the decision making. So context is perhaps the easiest one to think about because it's going on all around us. So regulation, for example, the use of standards is a very common way of shaping the context in, we make, in which we make decisions. The average uh, fuel efficiency of vehicles on the UK roads uh, has increased from 34 miles a gallon on average to what will be about 60 miles a gallon in the next five years. That's due to standards, making car manufacturers make more efficient vehicles. Uh, we can also provide information, so real-time displays which tell us in our homes how much electricity we're using at any given point and how much we're spending have been shown in large trials involving tens of thousands of homes to lead to a reduction of about 3% in our electricity consumption, simply by understanding and knowing what we're consuming. Uh, we can provide uh, financing in the form of grants and loans and subsidies and so forth. And again, the evidence suggests time and time again that this is an effective way of encouraging uh, pro-environmental behaviour. And this kind of language about finance and money and value is, has definitely found its way now into uh, kind of thinking about the natural environment. This is from the Wildlife Trust's magazine, an article by Tony Juniper, in which he's talking about the valuation of services provided by nature. There's been a lot of work actually run out of UEA on something called the National Ecosing Ecosystem Assessment doing similar things. So, for example, we find these odd sentences like, Pollinators provide crop production services worth £430 million a year. It's a pretty weird way to talk about bees, but it's basically the way that, the, in this case, the sort of conservation world can start talking the language of policymakers and regulators. So these are all ways to affect the context in which we make our decisions. But we can also try and influence the decisions themselves. Overcome, if you recall, what I described as these dragons of inaction, these barriers to pro-environmental behaviour. 
And um, the government have adopted uh, a, a mnemonic called MindSpace. Has anyone heard of MindSpace before? I know a few have. So for those of you who haven't, uh, uh, MindSpace is a mnemonic uh, of nine words. And, some of the, and each of these words or each of these phrases represents one of these barriers to pro-environmental action or action, uh, and therefore represents kind of a set of things you can try and do to try and encourage pro-environmental behavior. So let me give you uh, a few examples. The N in MindSpace refers to social norms. We're influenced by others. So in the US, trials involving millions of homes have found that if you show people not just their electricity consumption in their monthly bills, but how their electricity consumption compares with that of their most efficient neighbours, their consumption goes down by, on average, 2.5%, by nothing other than making them aware of where they stand in the social pecking order. Uh, another example from Mindspace, the D stands for default. Default means in any given situation where we're making a choice, there'll often be one thing which is the kind of no-brainer. Like if you were to make very little effort making the decision, there might be one option which is the default. Um, so an experiment in Germany found when you go and sign up for an electricity or a gas provider to your home, you can choose between various tariffs. Now you can choose a green electricity tariff, often with a small price premium, but you have to actively choose that. The default, if you like, will be the conventional option with a mixture of coal and gas and nuclear and so on. So in a German experiment, they switched that round. They persuaded an electricity provider to make the green power option the default. And you had to opt out of that to choose the regular tariff. What happens? A tenfold increase in the amount of people choosing green power. One final example from MindSpace. The S stands for salience. That is something that's salient, is something that is kind of visible, memorable, persuasive in some way. We, uh, we found, uh, found in a study in Devon that if you show people a thermal image with heat leaking out of their home, shown in, in bright blue, that they are five times more likely to install draft proofing than if you just give them information about how much energy they could save from the draft proofing, simply by making that heat loss visible and salient to them. So this kind of toolbox, if you like, from Mindspace provides a whole series of things we can do to support decisions in favour of environmental protection. And the government team who, who runs this within uh, across all the ministries called the Behavioural Insights Team had a big conference last year and they produced this booklet with all the evidence that shows these kinds of approaches work. So, to conclude, there is strong evidence that by shaping contextual influences and helping us make better decisions, we can address some of these challenges faced by uh, pro-environmental behaviour. Okay, so just to bring then Charlie and our kind of introduction to this to a close, my response then to, to, to Charlie's message. Um, what Charlie's just shown and very convincingly outlined is that thinking about behaviour change has a growing kind of track record. He's showing us some quite robust evidence for its effectiveness. But the argument that I would make, it's kind of obvious, I suppose, is that the kinds of changes, the amount, the size, the magnitude of the changes being realised through these approaches simply aren't enough. 2%, 5% and so on, they're just not big enough. Climate change, for example, is an 80% issue, not a 2% issue. We need to stop tinkering at the edges, I would argue, and get serious about trying to change these systems that support and uphold everyday life, rather than just trying to get people to turn the lights off in unused rooms. Charlie gave the example of in-home displays, um, which you probably, I'm sure many of you heard of the smart meter rollout that's going on at the moment, um, and the government's trying to give people, every, every household in Britain should have an in-home display that comes with their smart meter that gives them real-time information about how much energy they're using. The idea being that it will then encourage us to go round and turn things off and use less energy. In principle, kind of quite an interesting idea. And it is true, as Charlie's pointed out, that trials of these in-home displays lead to savings of 2 to 3% quite reliably. 
But when you look at more, in more depth at what's going on in these sorts of households, when people are confronted with this information, as I've done in some of my research, the sorts of ways in which people are responding to this feedback on their energy use are very, very telling and quite interesting, and I think undermine some of this behaviour change approach. So in my own research, I found that whilst households, when they received one of these monitors, were very happy to change a little bit of their behaviour, they were happy to go around and turn things off standby or turn lights off in unused room, they quickly reached limits, areas where they thought, well, actually, if I did anything more, it would start to make myself uncomfortable. They were incredibly unwilling, unsurprisingly, to not have that cup of tea when they first got in from work, to not wash their clothes or use the dishwasher, or to even do things like turn the thermostat down. These sorts of things were issues that households were simply unwilling to contemplate. And what this really reveals is that the way in which our normal ways of living demand energy use or water use or whatever else, that we're simply not willing to compromise. This isn't about individual choice. So the challenge becomes not simply making individuals reduce their waste, but asking bigger questions about everyday life and how it is the way it is. Not merely turning things off standby, but asking questions about, do we have too many electronic devices in our homes? Is our life too digital these days? Asking questions not merely about, should we use... Um, you know, not merely should we fill the washing machine up rather than use half loads or use the eco setting on the washing machine, but asking questions instead about what does society count as cleanliness? Do we have two demanding standards of what, what is clean? Once upon a time, we'd wash our clothes far less often than we do today, for example. Or not just simply turning the thermostat down by a degree, but thinking instead about what we count as a comfortable indoor temperature and whether or that's something we might think about changing. Now, worryingly, what trials of energy feedback and so on have shown is that whilst they're good at focusing on what you might describe as the bad consumption, the wasteful consumption, like lights left on or things on standby, what that also tends to give people is the message that everything else is good consumption. Everything else is okay, right? So I don't need to question how much energy it involves to keep my house at this temperature, all rooms, all year round, because I'm turning the lights off in unused rooms. It encourages people to do their bit and stop there. But as David Mackay, the famous, um, the, for, the former chief scientist at, at DEC, famously said, if everyone does a little, we'll only achieve a little. And so I think we need to go more than that. We need to think big, we need to think differently. So what do we do? So I think, to some extent, we're already engaging in these social and technological systems all the time in the sorts of policy decisions and planning decisions that we make. We're just doing so in ways that don't think about the resource requirements of these changes. So we need to think about how we might plan towns differently, for example, so that people don't need to commute. We need to think, or that people can engage with nature in different kinds of ways, for instance. We need to think about how we can build homes and workplaces in ways that reduce energy use rather than rely upon it. So there's questions like that about how do we plan these whole systems differently and to what extent can we reorient these trajectories but other approaches that are quite interesting, I think, that are encourages to open up questions about what is normal and where's that going. So there's so lots of very interesting work around what you might call what's called speculative design, not a particularly engaging phrase, but some really interesting, almost artworks, but kind of think pieces that encourage us to think differently. They've got this one thing that they call the standby caterpillar, and it's a simple wire that plugs your TV into the wall, but it moves. And when the TV is playing normally, and it's on, the caterpillar breathes calmly. When the TV is switched off at the mains, the wire is still, the caterpillar is still, it's asleep. But when you leave your TV on standby, the caterpillar writhes, and it makes you feel uncomfortable, and it forces you to think about the energy involved in normal everyday life. It's a very different way of giving feedback with energy use. Another example makes use of Twitter, actually, and it uses, it uses in-home displays, and when people are using more resources, more energy, it reads out in a kind of robotish voice tweets about energy use. Sometimes these tweets are things like, oh, I'm already doing my bit, I'm doing really well, or tips on how to save things. But sometimes they're critiques of the government or the big six energy companies to ask people to think differently about what the energy system could be, should be, and how we might therefore move in more sustainable directions. So just to conclude my bit then, we need to stop, I'd say, focusing on the small successes, the 2, 3, 5, 10% savings we can achieve through behaviour change and start facing up instead to the difficult questions, very difficult, complicated, sure, about how we might meaningfully bring about large-scale social and technological change. 
Okay, so Charlie and I then have hopefully just introduced some different perspectives. I'm sure actually there's, there's probably more overlap between our views than we've let on. <laughs> but, but what we've done, as Charlie said at the beginning, we've talked a lot about our own research, understandably, around energy, climate change, and so on. But um, we understand entirely that the audience is people coming from lots of different sorts of perspectives, working, nature, conservation, those sorts of things. So we would be really interested in learning from you through the discussion about to the extent, the extent to which you're already working with those, these ideas, the extent to which they do or do not apply in the sorts of fields that you're operating in. Um, so we'd just be really, really, we'd really value the opportunity to learn from you, actually, about the extent to which these ideas compute or, or not. But thank you very much for your attention.